This is John Alt, this is Instruction Industry, collaboration with Office 365 and data visualization with Power BI. Go through our agenda here real quick. We have some just brief introductions. I always figure it's good to know who's uh, who's presenting and talking with you today. So we have a brief introduction to Joel Sorensen and myself. Then we have kind of some content to set the stage, I would call it, around uh, what we see as kind of common challenges in the construction industry and why the content today is relevant for it. And then we really do have very kind of focused content around two specific products. Um, one Office 365 that Joe will present, he's gonna kind of highlight that and kind of why it matters. So a lot of you, if you haven't made this kind of migration, um, have at least heard of this uh, solution. And I think it is important and relevant in kind of the mobile workforce of uh, construction industry. And then we're gonna talk about a business intelligence example using Power BI for Microsoft. Uh, we think these are both kind of powerful tools that are applicable to the industry. So just by way of introduction, Joe, you can introduce yourself. Probably don't need to read the whole thing, but you can give, you, give it a quick introduction and then I'll do the same. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been with Hyde Bailey for a little over seven years. Um, I help our clients with all, all kinds of uh, mostly infrastructure, uh, servers and collaboration tools. Uh, probably over the past few years, bit more specialized in cloud infrastructure and collaboration systems. Great, thanks Joe. This is, uh, again, this is John Alt. I'm a senior manager. I've been with the firm for just a little bit over 10 years. And uh, as my bio says, 20 years of experience in the industry. Um, kind of one of my current, uh, I'll call it projects or current passions is kind of helping clients use business intelligence tools and data analytics tools. So uh, that's kind of be sort of my part at the end of the presentation as well. So we, we felt like it was important to kind of set the stage of why does all of this kind of content, why is it relevant in the construction industry? And we wanted to highlight a few things. I think that you clearly have in the construction industry a highly mobile workforce. So you have a large percentage of employees in, in many environments are not necessarily, you know, sitting at a desk all day the way maybe we are at iBailey if we're doing work for clients, that kind of thing. Uh, so we do think that that, is, that does present some unique challenges. The solutions you put in place kind of need to support that type of workflow or that, that type of environment. You have kind of often disconnected users. So you have this need to be able to work in a disconnected fashion in remote locations, especially uh, in some of our geographies. So we feel like uh, th that disconnected nature of the users is, uh, is somewhat of a challenge and not 100% unique to just construction, but it is one of those things that, that makes uh, the deployment of technology and construction a challenge. Oftentimes you have a lot of concurrent projects going on. Certainly I would guess that uh, most of you hope that that's the case. Uh, so kind of managing the complexity around that becomes a challenge. So we have um, kind of some applicability of the tools for that as well. And then also that kind of disparate and non-integrated system. So we've kind of got a lot of systems. I've seen places where we've got one system in the US, they made another one to do project management, another one to do uh, kind of my your finance, those kind of things. So some of the tools we'll talk about today can be used to kind of integrate and collect um, and present the data out of multiple of those systems at the same time. So we feel like um, that's those challenges are some of the things that uh, the tools we'll be talking about today help uh, help our clients address. In kind of prepping for this discussion, uh, one of the things that I think really jumps out is that, and this is 100% my, my quote here, but the construction as an industry has a long history of, and I put it in quotes, under investing in information technology. So if you look at some of these other industries, I do a lot of work in the healthcare arena as well. They're kind of in the middle on this chart. Um, but I think this chart is somewhat telling. You look at the construction industry, and this is as a percentage of revenue, is at the is really at the bottom. Now you'll find this metric. Sometimes it's going to be per FTE. Sometimes it's going to be you know a few different ways that we'll measure it. But I don't think that you can look at it about any study and you'll find that the construction industry largely lags behind in their investment in technology. Now that's not meant to be critical. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I'm not suggesting you should go strive to be at seven percent like a bank uh, anytime soon. But I do think it's important to understand that kind of as an industry we're maybe not quite fully taking advantage of technology. And uh, there are lots of opportunities for improvement in, uh, in a lot of our clients, we, we feel. I also think it's that, that lowest, uh, or that last point, excuse me, is also an important point to make in that you really need to, I think it's important to understand that um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. So in that nature that says, look, if our business model only supports that 1.5-ish percent 
advantage of, of investment in technology, it becomes all the more important to get a lot of bang for your buck, if you will, and get a lot of value out of those technology investments. So in kind of the modern world with cloud services and the ability to kind of share the cost, if you will, across multiple uh, clients, it's fairly easy for technology companies to deliver this in a manner that can, can fit into some of those constraints that are, are common in the industry. So for our uh, content today, we're gonna to explore two specific Microsoft solutions. We're gonna explore some kind of collaboration and communications content. Uh, that's what Joe is gonna do here next. He's gonna talk about Office 365. And I think that you'll all find that, um, that there's definitely some applicability from your uh, industry perspective. I also wanna highlight that as you look through that, I think we, we find a lot of clients are using this tool set today. So they have Office 365 or maybe underutilizing it. I mean, they haven't taken advantage of everything that they're paying for. So as Joe go through, goes through that content, I think it's important to understand that, uh, that maybe even if we already have it, uh, there's probably some things we could do to extend our use of the tool set and get more value for the, the dollars that we're already spending on that. And then we're gonna talk about what we've labeled timely business insights. This is really kind of business intelligence. And we're gonna talk about a, a somewhat related product, I'll call it to Office 365 from Microsoft called Power BI. Uh, we'll have some content just generically around business intelligence and why it's relevant and why it's important uh, for most businesses. And then we have a couple of uh, uh, construction industry examples. They're not commercials, they're not iBailey solutions even. Uh, we do this kind of work, but we've picked a couple of publicly available, Microsoft calls them partner showcases, to kind of highlight the types of things you can do uh, um, with a, a tool like Power BI. So Joe, I think uh, it's, it's your turn and you're gonna cover Office 365. Yep, thanks, John. With our time today, I just wanted to cover, you know, what is Microsoft Office 365? And how is it tradi uh, different from traditional software? I'll dig into a few of the collaboration tools in Office 365 and some of the security solutions Microsoft has built for securing the data in the cloud. When we use the term Office 365, it, it's really just used to describe a suite of different Microsoft cloud-based products. And uh, the primary uh, products listed here are Exchange Online, so uh, this is an uh, email service. Many organizations are familiar with Microsoft Exchange Server. Uh, Exchange Online really takes the, the management of um, you know, building and maintaining an on-prem Exchange Server out of, the, out of the equation and delivers uh, the same Exchange experience and administration capability um, in a hosted solution. Um, OneDrive for Business is, uh, is Microsoft's personal file storage uh, solution. And SharePoint Online is, uh, is used for file storage in more of a team setting and can be used as a, like a company-wide internet to distribute data for others. Skype for Business. So Skype for Business is, you know, your instant messaging, uh, online meetings, video conferencing tool. Skype for Business is actually going away and being replaced with Microsoft Teams. So we'll, we'll touch on both because both are still being uh, used. Microsoft Teams includes some additional features um, like, like file storage and sharing uh, between group members, um, sort of starts to integrate some of the other systems in Office 365 into a single application. Office Online, what we're referring to here are the you know, applications we're familiar with like Excel, Word, um, delivered through a web browser. So no installation of the applications on your computer, uh, but the ability to use those familiar apps right in your web browser. And then of course, the uh, traditional Microsoft Office desktop apps can be uh, you know, um, delivered through Office 365, installed on your computer. And uh, it, we're, we're probably all familiar with the use of those. They're just delivered in a, in a little bit different way. Office 365 is available in multiple plans. So each of these products is um, available as a standalone product, uh, but you know, Office 365 is taking these products, piecing them together into different bundles uh, that might suit an organization or individuals within that organization. Uh, Microsoft categorizes these into two main tiers, the business tier. Uh, they used to call this a small business tier. They, they dropped the word small. 
Um, so it's just business and the enterprise. And really the differentiator here, business plans can go up to, uh, in organizations up to 300 users. Business, you know, organizations with less than 300 users can still use plans in the enterprise tier, all the way down to, you know, single user organizations can use an enterprise plan. It's just sort of how Microsoft has structured the different bundles. So how is uh, Office 365 different from traditional apps? Well, one of the key features is it's always up to date. So you don't have to worry about updating your applications as features are, are developed and, and released, they're automatically pushed out. Um, so if you're using Microsoft Word, for instance, you may receive a, a little notification saying updates are available and you can just allow those updates to take place. You know, so rather than going through, you know, we're, uh, Office 2010 and 2013 and 2016 and now 19, really uh, that's just becoming the Office product. And, uh, and these apps are just being uh, updated continuously. Likewise, the server side components like Exchange or SharePoint, you're no longer having to, you know, regularly maintain uh, patch, update these, that's all being done on the back end for you. Um, so that saves uh, obviously time, um, downtime, and uh, a lot of the, that management IT overhead associated with that. Another key feature of Office 365, because it's cloud-based, you can access uh, Office 365 solutions anytime from anywhere. There's no VPN required, so you don't have to connect to the office and then get to your data from there. Um, you can just access that through a, a PC, a Mac, a tablet, or a phone. You know, office apps are available for Android and iOS mobile devices. Um, so when you're, when you're traveling <laughs> or out in the field, uh, it's easy to get to your data in Office 365. Uh, and then of course, document sharing. You know, OneDrive and SharePoint versus the traditional company file server, uh, the same concept there. Uh, putting your files in somewhere where they can be accessed all the time uh, versus, you know, stuck in a file server where you have to be either in the office or connected to the office through VPN to get to those files. You can share documents internally and externally. So users outside the organization can view your documents in OneDrive or SharePoint online, and you get to control on an on a individual document level uh, whether the person you're sharing with can edit those files or if their access to those is only read-only. All right, uh, that brings us to polling question number one. Awesome. Polling question number one, true or false? With Office 365, your product will always be up to date, unlike the traditional app. Looks like everyone was listening. All right. So we'll take a, a little deeper dive here into OneDrive for Business and SharePoint Online. Uh, they they have the same kind of look and feel to them because they're really built on the same platform. Um, but OneDrive for Business includes up to a terabyte of personal file storage per user. Uh, it allows users to share files internally and externally. And uh, there is a OneDrive for Business app that you can install on Mac or PC. And it will synchronize your content locally to your device. So this is great, you know, if you're uh, not on the internet, or, you know, you're you're traveling out in the field, there's no internet access, and you need to uh, create or modify files, uh, as soon as you reconnect to the internet, uh, that data will be synced back into your OneDrive. And again, you can create and edit documents from a browser uh, or your desktop apps. So once your files are in OneDrive or SharePoint Online, uh, then you can edit them through that Office Online, the Office apps in your web browser. But at any time, you can also edit these files in your traditional desktop applications. SharePoint Online builds upon the functionality of OneDrive. It's designed more for uh, you know, groups of users to share data amongst one another. So team sites in SharePoint are sort of the go-to for file storage, maybe some news updates or job calendars. You know, automation can be built into SharePoint Online. Uh, so maybe you have a, an approval process um, for you know submitting some kind of work order. Uh, you you could create some workflows. So if someone modifies a file and you know puts that into the next phase of the workflow, the person responsible for that next task receives an alert that it's their turn to, to go and complete whatever needs to be done. 
document versioning is a, is a feature of SharePoint Online that's really cool. Um, as you edit the document, SharePoint Online will automatically create a new version of that file. So if you ever want to go back in time and restore a previous version to the current version or make a copy of that previous version, uh, that's all available through document versioning. There's also some content management features in SharePoint Online, similar to uh, a content management system, if you're familiar with one of those. Um, you can attach additional metadata to documents. Uh, you could even en enforce that when a document is uploaded to a certain library in SharePoint Online, that uh, you know metadata fields are, are added or values are put in. Um, and this can be helpful for data search in e-discovery. Uh, so if you, you know, content in SharePoint Online is always being indexed. So if you need a search for something, you can just punch your keyword in and it's going to return anything relevant to what you're searching for uh, to the extent that you have access to it. So if there's something out there that you don't have permission to see, you won't see it in your search results, but it is a great way to locate data in the system. So a good question I like to ask when trying to determine where to store a document is, is this document mine? or is this ours? Of course, if it's, if it's my document, it's okay to store in OneDrive. If it's our document, I want that to be out there in SharePoint Online so everyone else can get to it too. All right, so continuing on with the collaboration tools. Skype for Business, we talked about a little bit, really the instant messaging, uh, chat, and video calling. Recently, Microsoft added the ability uh, to do a, a full phone system in the uh, in Skype for Business. I guess it's been around for some time, um, but really the uh, the cloud phone system or a fully cloud-based phone system is, uh, I think, came around in the, about two years ago. And again, um, Skype for Business transitioning out. There's still a lot of organizations using it, but Microsoft Teams is taking over that functionality. And uh, with Microsoft Teams, uh, you sort of have, uh, if you're familiar with Skype, you, you had this application you'd open a window and chat with someone. And in Teams, you open a, a little bigger application and you can do a whole lot more in it. So, you know, you can chat with a, a person. Um, if you're a member of a group, your entire group will have access to uh, a stored conversation. Uh, so you'll be able to see updates and, and go back in time and, and view those conversations. You can share files right through the app with your group members. Um, on the back end, that's all being saved in SharePoint. Uh, but it's available in your Teams app, uh, which makes it a lot easier to collaborate on documents. Um, and you can also add uh, Microsoft and third-party apps for collaboration. So I don't know if you can see the, the image, but we have these tabs at the top uh, in our team, and we can add additional tabs. Uh, you know, if, if we want to, we could add a planner. So if we're going to do some some resource scheduling or some kind of project scheduling, we could use the planner uh, to do that. And we could even add Power BI for visualizations, maybe checking on our progress, um, things like that. So whenever we talk about putting data in the cloud, data security always gets brought up. And so I wanted to touch on that a little bit. You know, Microsoft has addressed this. They, they have a, a global team of 3,500 security experts whose, whose job is to keep the Microsoft Cloud secure. Um, you know, that's 100% focus, and, and we often can't say the same for, for our IT resources who are often dealing with many things at once. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a really big team of, of folks working to develop these security uh, applications and keep that data secure. Um, specific to file sharing, you know, being able to choose who your files are shared with and even being able to choose on an individual file level whether or not the recipient can edit or only read that file is a, a de definite differentiator between the traditional methods of file sharing. Um, as an organization, you can also limit external sharing or, or turn it off completely. Uh, ransomware, it, you know, if you're not familiar with ransomware, that's probably a good thing. Um, ransomware is a type of uh, malware where, uh, you know, it'll encrypt your files and demand some type of monetary ransom to uh, decrypt those so you can access them again. Well, there is some ransomware protection built into these collaboration tools. 
uh, you know, content in uh, SharePoint Online, OneDrive and Teams cannot be executed. So, um, you know, a ransomware attack can't spread throughout the system. Uh, document versioning can help recover versions of a file that predate ransomware encryption. And you also have the ability to restore items that maybe were deleted or corrupted uh, through built-in features uh, in, the, in the applications. Uh, Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection builds upon a lot of the built-in uh, features. Most of the ATP fe uh, features are uh, add-on components um, that enhance the different security solutions uh, within these products. So, you know, ATP um, in SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams automatically is scanning files looking for some type of virus or malware, and we'll put a block on these files if they discover anything. Uh, ATP is also available for Exchange Online, um, and the primary features there are uh, um, safe attachments and safe links. And the safe attachments feature will scan attachments on your emails as they come in. It actually will execute these uh, files and monitor behavior to determine if they're doing things they shouldn't. And if they're not, you, you can strip those attachments out and send a notice to the uh, the recipient that you know someone tried to send them something that may not be safe. Similar, the safe links feature. If someone were to embed a link in a in an email they send you. Microsoft will rewrite that link. So if you click on it, it won't actually take you directly to the site. It will take you through Microsoft, and Microsoft will go out, fetch that site, and return it to you and inspect it upon return. And if it is malicious, they'll block that, usually in the form of a, a warning uh, screen that just tells you what you're trying to access is potentially unsafe. And you know administrators can determine if you are allowed to click through that or if you want to stop the user there. And then there's uh, anti-phishing and spoof intelligence features in ATP as well that prevent your users from receiving phishing attacks and can prevent your domain from being spoofed, uh, which could ultimately uh, damage your, your domain reputation. And now we're at polling question two. Pulling question number two, true or false, Microsoft Teams brings in more features and is designed to be a hub for teamwork. Awesome. So just a couple more security features with Office 365 to touch on here uh, include identity and access management. In Office 365, we want to make sure that we have authorized users and authorized devices accessing uh, our data in the cloud. And uh, we do that through the identity and access management. Um, we could require multi-factor authentication, and this may prevent someone whose uh, compromised credentials are out there uh, and someone tries to log in using those, they won't be able to get in if two-factor authentication is enabled. Conditional access can limit who can access data from where or from what device. And, uh, and there is some advanced security reporting that tells us you know, what's going on, who's trying to access what from where uh, that can be enabled and, and reviewed. Device management, so enterprise security and mobility is Microsoft's product for device management. And again, uh, EMS can apply conditional access policies. So if you, let's say on your mobile device, uh, you wanna access your email or OneDrive, uh, you may be blocked from doing so until you enroll that device in your organization's uh, device management service. And, uh, and this uh, you know, ensures that the device is with the person that it's supposed to be and uh, allows you to assign some different you know security controls over that device um, such as encryption uh, maybe limitations on copying uh, pasting and saving from documents and uh, of course you can you can perform a device or an application level data wipe if uh, if that device goes missing finally uh, data loss prevention uh, is really the practice of identifying and blocking the sharing of sensitive information. So um, Office 365 can, can look for characteristics within content such as um, you know, credit card numbers or social security numbers. You can create data loss prevention policies that would prevent the sharing of that content uh, within or outside the organization. 
And if someone were to try and do that, you can even um, you know educate them by sending them an email saying you know that what you've tried to do is against company policy or a policy tip, which is sort of a real time notification, letting that user know that what they're doing isn't allowed and uh, may help alleviate some of that uh, activity in the future. And polling question number three. All right, polling question number three, true or false? The multi-factor authorization can help prevent compromised credentials from being, uh, from, excuse me, credentials from accessing data. All right, we're ready to move on. All right, we're going to uh, kind of move on to the second section of content. We're going to kind of go through a few examples of sort of business intelligence. If you saw in Joe's content on Teams, it was an example where you can kind of embed this in Teams. So if I go back to that just a bit, if people are familiar with things like Slack, um, Teams is somewhat Microsoft's answer to Slack. Uh, you can take the kinds of things we'll talk through in these examples and embed them in a collaboration tool like that. Uh, they can also get embedded in other ERP applications. So if you're using uh, like a NetSuite or a Sage, uh, depending on the platform, some of this uh, this type of stuff can get embedded back into those tools as well. So we're gonna there's gonna be a video pop up here. Um, I'll kind of comment over it a little bit. There's some audio, but you won't hear the audio. But I wanted to kind of have a way to introduce the topic a bit so people could get a sense of when we talk about Power BI, what is it? What does it mean? The audio that you don't hear is literally just some commentary, but what they're showing is kind of the visualizations, the output of doing work in Power BI. So think of it as you go collect data from multiple sources, and they're going to actually show you a couple examples of that a little bit later here. Public sources, it could be your website, it could be uh, your ERP system. So I think they use um, uh, some search analytics. So this is Google Analytics. This is visits to your website. You can all those kind of things. So think of it as assembling data from all over the place and then visualizing it to kind of tell a story to say, oh, this is something interesting about kind of your business, your operations. You saw the one example there, it was kind of streaming data in and out. You can kind of take data real time from sites. But the, the key point here is that I always say that a lot of data that we have is kind of locked inside our systems and we don't necessarily have a great way to use it. Uh, to manage our business. Now, there are a million things that's going through very, very quickly here. I know you have the, the PowerPoint, so you can look at that at a later date if you want to look at it a little bit slower. But it's uh, key thing is unlock kind of the power of the data. I always say our goal with business intelligence and Power BI with clients is to help clients make better decisions faster, right? So we're trying to take those things that, that you have kind of locked up in your systems and make them available to make really good um kind of business decisions going forward. Why is this important? I always, this is somewhat uh, to kind of dovetail off the previous comment, but the answers to the questions um, about um, the performance of your business are typically in your systems. We just oftentimes uh, historically in the technology industry have not been really great at making them very accessible. So I think that that's the key thing to a point is that usually there's kind of a pain point that someone's trying to solve. I'm trying to understand in construction, I hear a lot about scheduling, it seems like with uh, resources, or I'm trying to understand uh, if I'm gonna have a budget problem on a project a little bit earlier than I would otherwise see it. You can kind of surface those things and make better decisions. I think the other thing to think about is that most, gener most businesses today are generating significantly more information and data than they have, uh, or they did just a few years ago, but they have trouble making sense of it. So there's kind of this whole discipline with these tools called storytelling. So you kind of uh, say that the goal is to be able to go tell a story about the business with the data and kind of communicate it effectively. So trying to use all those things. I had a, a colleague of mine once tell me, I use a, a system, but all I do is feed it. It doesn't do anything for me. I think of this as having it do something for you, trying to take the information that you maybe record in the course of doing your business, but now I want to try to surface it and uh, make better decisions. I think the third point about why this is important is it's rapidly becoming a much more affordable and accessible solution for a typical kind of small business or for a construction business that doesn't invest a ton of money in technology. This particular example, the software itself, now I don't want to create the impression that that's the only cost, but the software itself is $10 a month per user. So very, very low cost. It does take some investment typically to go out and turn it into something but the end game can be very, very powerful. And uh, I think it's a, a good return on investment typically. 
So we're going to kind of take a few minutes and I'm going to walk through two examples here. I'll, I'll pop out of the PowerPoint in just a second. Um, but we're going to walk through two examples that are uh, built on, they're on what Microsoft calls their partner showcase. So these are uh, examples that companies not I'd Bailey, I thought that would be more appropriate to kind of show relatively uh, agnostic ones, if you will, uh, from a CPE perspective. So we're going to show two examples about kind of how a BI solution can be used to kind of do that, help help you make better decisions faster. So I think it should be right here. This first one, and again, these are kind of blinded generic public examples examples, but I thought that they were kind of relevant for the audience. So if you look at, if you think about this particular business, they clearly have kind of three different uh, main lines of business. They have residential contracts, they have industrial contracts and commercial contracts. So typically we'd maybe go run a report out of our uh, kind of ERP or our management system. And you'd kind of have to dig through it to find the information and all those kind of things. And they've got three years worth of history and you've got um, multiple months, but think of it as a way to kind of slice and dice the information and sort of interact with this palette and say, well, what's what's interesting about the business today? So right now I'm looking at residential contracts. If I hit residential, it'll actually, you'll see everything adjust. Now I'm looking at all three, right? So I can kind of compare if I'm maybe the general manager of the entire business, this is what I want to look at. I want to look at virtually everything. If I wanted to, on the industrial contracts kind of director or division head, maybe that's all I want to look at. Well, now I look at my geography. I've seen what that business looks like kind of across the continuum of the geographies. But if, now if I may maybe only working in the east, if I click on east here, now all the numbers adjust in the story. Uh, actually, not all, but most of those numbers adjust. You could make these adjust, by the way. Uh, they've chosen not to in this particular case. Now I'm looking at just East contracts. I'm looking at average revenue per uh, contract compared to the overall average. So I think that that's a, can be kind of an interesting story is the point. And right now I'm only looking at 2015. I don't even know in some cases there's no data in previous years, right? But I could look at all three years, you get the general idea of it. It gives you the ability. I always tell people in, in, in the simplest form, uh, the things you do with a Power BI like this are kind of like uh, pivot tables on steroids, right? So it's a way to take the things that you've done in the past and really kind of automate it. Whereas today, you might go assemble data out of multiple systems and you have to kind of manually do it and look at a report at the, uh, at the close of a month. Uh, now you've automated that in a way that um, uh, you can look at it much more frequently. I tell our story for this all the time. We use this technology in our technology consulting practice, and we literally look at things on the business operation side of things, I would say, on a uh, weekly basis that we used to look at, say, after the previous month closed. So there's an awful lot of water that runs under the bridge that we're now able to see and kind of correct course of the business uh, in a much more timely fashion than you would typically be able to do with kind of waiting for the month to close, looking at reports, those kind of things. So we, we literally go out and kind of create metrics that we want to manage the business by in that interim time between periods. We still look at close um, month close kind of statements, but we're looking at kind of key indicators throughout the month that really when a time comes to look at the financial result, it's almost a moot point. We already kind of know what's going to happen. It's a fairly straightforward kind of thing. So just to kind of continue through this, we won't go through every bit of example in here, but I do think it is important to understand. You can kind of see the breakdown of the business here. So you see which ones of them are in geographies. Um, and that's again, because we've selected residential as just residential, you'll see the mix for industrial will look a little bit different probably and commercial as well. And then also um, over time. So it tells you a little bit of a trend on the business. You can kind of hover over it and see what each one of those data points are. I think the key thing to understand here is, is that this is not just about kind of a re replacement for Excel. It's a kind of an analysis tool. There are sort of two ways I see people use this technology. One of them is very tactical. I'm gonna kind of push some data out to a manager and I'm just telling them, here's where you're at on those sort of key performance indicators. Maybe these are the, the numbers that you'll notice in this example, they don't have any of them changing. So maybe here, these are all ones that uh, you want everybody to look at and rally around. But maybe if I'm the manager of the commercial contracts division, I'm gonna push it down to maybe some supervisors. All I really want them to know is 
red, yellow, green, if you, I always say, are we good? Are we good? Are we okay? Are we bad? But you wait, it's uh, the tools provide a way to kind of collaborate and rally around those metrics. Uh, you take advantage of sort of the innate, I'll call it competitiveness of, uh, of your employees. But maybe, so in a way you would uh, kind of deploy that down is if you got down to the point where I was the manager in Maine, this is only the information you'd give to that individual commercial contracts manager in the state of Maine. So now you've kind of made the, delevant, the data relevant to just them without having to generate a separate report in Excel manually, all those kind of things. So think of it as I connect up to all my systems, sort of paint this picture, tell this story, and now uh, the people have the the right people have the right information at their fingertips to to, uh, to kind of monitor the effectiveness of the business. Only thing I think that's important on this is geography. So I thought this is somewhat important to highlight. Um, in this particular case, we didn't develop this, so I might have to kind of defer a bit on the exact details. But usually, the the circle is telling the size of the circle is telling you one thing, and the color is telling you another. So it'll be uh, something about maybe uh, that totals or something about uh, revenue or profit, those kind of things. So you can kind of conditionally format what uh, tools like Power BI do is they will import data from uh, geographical information system. So a lot of you have that for managing your fleet would be an example. You'd maybe get a sense of hotspots, if you will, or where fleets are at. You generally are going to know that, but I think it might be interesting to overlay that with some financial metrics. So. Uh, Power BI and, and tools similar to it uh, take that GIS data or they will take public sources of data and can overlay it on a map. So a public source of data might be the common one we see is U.S. Census data. So it'll take data that has disposable income by zip code. So you can literally get down to an individual zip code uh, to do that type of analysis. So that's the first example. Get out of that one. I'm going to pull up the second one. The second one is a little bit more financially focused, I thought, given the audience that there might be some interest in that. Um, so this is probably going to be more interesting to folks who care about um, a little bit more financial reporting. I want to caution you a little bit that these tools are not intended to be kind of your, your complete financial reporting solution, if you will, but they are good for pulling out some of those uh, KPI metric kind of things. So in this case, I mentioned before that you might want to see uh, see a few kind of highlights. I think of this as well, if I'm presenting to a board of directors and you really want to know, well, what does revenue look like? Well, here's what revenue looks like over time. Gives you a little bit of a trend. The way that this is visualized in Power BI, this is telling you what the number is. Green tells you it's good. Red tells you it's bad, obviously. But revenue is generally trending up is what this tells you. So that's a kind of their way of visualizing that. Same thing with profit. Profit is trending up, so we're heading in the right direction, but we're behind target right now. So you get kind of the general idea of things. Um, I think that this is a good example of a fairly high level, how do we look at it? So if you've got kind of leaders that maybe aren't that engaged in the financial details, you can give them something like this and it would update, I always say, automatically, right? So you don't really need to spend a lot of time thinking and working through it. The systems automatically update this, publish it out. And by the way, the names of the companies you see here, they're companies that, like I Bailey, build these types of things for clients. So they connect up to sources. It's not a product. Think of it as they're helping people apply uh, the use of the tool, in this case, Power BI, to kind of get... Um, communicate and tell that story that you want to have. I think that on this page, the couple things that are important is it does show you that you can kind of mix and match a little bit of sort of the table view of the world, right? Versus not everything needs to be that sort of pretty visual. Uh, this gives you a little bit more detail about what's happening in each individual month of revenue and expense and profit. Same as before, I believe it should. If you do that, you'll see everything kind of ripple through and adjust a little bit. So now I'm just looking at January for the data, data period that I'm looking at. So again, think of it as, I would say those more advanced use of pivot tables, but also the sort of filtering that you would do in Excel. It's very um, sort of Excel-like on the back end. We won't probably go through all 12 pages on this. I'll kind of page through a few of them just so you get a, a general sense of how it would work. But in this case, we've got several categories of KPIs that you want to look at, you'll see the, the content adjust to assets now. So in this case, I'm trying to look at what my 
uh, trends look like. So in, the, in this case, they've chosen a monthly, quarterly, and yearly view, your date view, expenses. So I think of it when you get into a little bit more detailed view of the world as kind of a tool to troubleshoot the business. So rather than having to turn into a big research project where someone has to go generate a manual report and then you found some other problem and they got to go in and generate another one that gives you more detail there, kind of the, the knack is if you figured out how to use these tools properly, a really good almost business analyst kind of person we would say can sit down and help kind of diagnose problems and challenges in the business. These are things that oftentimes in a more closely held business, the, the owners or the leaders have a pretty good gut feel for but here's a way to kind of help elevate the game. You could take kind of a marginal department head manager and turn them into a rock star with business intelligence, in my opinion, because you put the right information at their fingertips and say, watch this. This is what's important to watch these numbers. So the same kind of things that uh, you'll conditionally format uh, in Excel, telling you whether things are good or bad, all of those things still apply. Page through them quickly here just to keep moving. I personally think this is a little bit, I would be a little bit cautious of doing this. This is getting to a more traditional kind of financial statement, but I think it's important to know that it's not just pretty graphs and pictures. So you can connect up to your data source and generate something like this that looks like a more traditional financial statement of some, tor some type of, uh, of document. So again, those are two examples. Um, I would say we've, we've chosen to highlight Power BI here. There's many other competing products. If you've heard of Tableau, that would be one of them. SciSense is another. Domo, all of them kind of have their place in the market, and I barely we view it as we're kind of agnostic on those tools. What really matters is helping clients use data to make better decisions for their business. So we have a fourth poll question on just kind of whether you found the webinar helpful or not, and uh, then we'll move on to some Q&A. All right, so we do have time for questions. Obviously, we try to leave a little bit of time for that, but just to kind of close, I think I wanted to highlight a couple of things one of them is that what you're seeing here today these are not you know I, I i think when i go back to that that sort of investment in technology by construction companies what you're seeing today these are not things that take a huge investment like switching to a new erp system or putting in a new estimating system some of the things that i think you've invested in are very very good useful tools i think what we're talking about today are things that kind of support collaboration around that data and collaboration around the content that you use to generate um, uh, kind of activity in your business. So I, one of the messages I think it's important to, as a takeaway from this is that sometimes tools that you already have, or, excuse me, or can be added at a very low cost could be leveraged more effectively uh, to kind of produce value for the business. And hopefully that uh, today's session has kind of highlighted some of that for you. And with that, if there's any questions, I haven't seen any in the box so far, but if there's any, if people want to type them, we'd be happy to to ask anything. Otherwise, uh, thank you all very much for your time today. We appreciate it. Okay, well, I don't see any questions, um, but if you guys do have anything, feel free to reach out directly to Joe or John, and they can help answer any questions and provide more information if needed. Uh, this webcast has been recorded and will be um, published on our YouTube site. It would also be sent out to you guys um, for um, later viewing. So thank you to John and Joe and to all our participants. Okay. Thanks for your time, everybody. We appreciate it. Have a good day.